And joining me right now is Mr. Stephen Bassett. How are you, my friend? I'm fine, Michael. Glad to see you. This is the first time I'm seeing you on camera here on uh, this domain, and uh, you're looking sharp out there in the black. Liking the setup, my friend. I'm seeing all the uh, books in the, on the shelf there, and I'm um, seeing the very infamous arcade game in the background there. Galaxian, yep. That's right. I, uh, I've had that sign for 26 years. When I moved into the office in D.C., and it was what a family home, and I, uh, I had to get stuff right. So sure. And Bethesda is is, is uh, yard sale heaven. Absolutely. Because it's filled with upscale people. A lot of them are you know, diplomats, things like that. Come in, they come in for stints, a couple of years, then they leave. And so they got to sell everything. And so you just go, you get, you just map out a bunch, of, and you can get anything you want, good stuff for you know, 10 cents in the dollar. So I just went out and I'm going through it, and I saw this sign sitting on the grass. Very nice. Messed up, and I, how much? Five bucks. So I bought it, took it home. I took a black marker and kind of just kind of tidied it up. Oh, okay. And I put it up there in the office, and I was staring at it for years. That's a good piece to have. And I came to the realization that that's who I am. I'm a Galaxian. That you are. And uh, you're known as a political disclosure activist, and you've been at this since 1995. And I've always had the deepest respect for you going into this uh, specific uh, field, this issue, as it's a, it, it's always been a subject that was considered a uh, taboo back then in yesteryear. And fast forward today, and now it's official mainstream news, Mr. Bassett. Finally. Finally, exactly. And uh, we, we've known about UFOs, UAPs, flying saucers for the longest time since man's inception. Uh, events of star people interacting with us has always existed. And this issue, uh, one has, this issue has always been a really complicated for whatever reasons. Well, whoever's holding the, the keys to the, the kingdom, as they say, always suppression in this field. And Mr. Bassett, I'm sure you are more than delighted that we finally have all this progress uh, going forward with this issue. Yeah. Um, I think the ETs have been around for a long time. Uh, they can come and go when they want. Go back to early human existence, uh, say the very beginning of our species, about 250,000, give or take. Not a lot happening. Of course, that was the scene in beginning of one of the great movies of all time. Right. 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, and the implication was there was an intervention at some point that took a particular homo species and started, started it up a path that led to homo sapiens sapiens, an intervention by non-human. It was the best representation of that ever. Uh, and no, nobody's come close to that. So, uh, the idea and, and the evidence is clear that they've been coming uh, certainly in the, in the, since the flood 12,000 years when we got more interesting a lot more interesting not that our planet wasn't always interesting I mean it's a giant biosphere of life I mean if you're an extraterrestrial biologist what could be more interesting than a, an entire biosphere that developed completely independent of almost independent of all other biospheres, factoring in possible panspermia. panspermia. So we've been around. Right. <laughs> but in terms of uh -huh. us, we don't start getting interesting until after the flood. And then we start getting really interesting about 120 years ago. I'm with you on that one. And that's some, you know, you, you bring up panspermia, and that's always what I was led to believe how everything came to be. Um, are, are you religious at all, Mr. Bassett? I've always wondered this. You're, you're, okay, so you're like a, you're basically an atheist, in other words. I prefer to say non-religious. Okay, that's even better. Okay. Um, so, the thing about panspermia, it's a numbers game. Yes, sir. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I got into this, we were reading, I was reading about primordial slime. Now, this is all the way back in 64. Mm, yeah. Before, yeah. Primordial slime. And the theories back then about how life came about from inorganic matter. 
And they've actually done experiments to try to replicate the primordial slime. And, and, and I don't know where the science is now, but I think if they had really conclusively shown how inorganic non-replicating matter in the proper, with the proper temperature and enough time and whatever, the primordial soup could develop life, I think it would probably be a big deal. So I don't think they're quite there yet. But in other words, one planet is one particular option. It's one particular uh, example. You got certain mass, you got X amount of water, you got certain temperature cycles, certain distance from the sun and all that, right? And you've got whatever the earth matter was made up of, which may not be the same from solar system to solar system in terms of ratios and this and that. But you take it all together, and then you, you add water, atmosphere develops, no life, start getting electric storms, primordial slime, whatever, and so forth, boom. Somehow, at some point, all of this starts to form something, slightly complex molecules, that then can, in some way, start replicate. Okay. And again, one can make a case the odds of this would seem extremely small. And I would, I would have to agree. If, if, you were, if you were watching the initial beginning of our solar system and the accretion disk around the sun, and you're trying to predict uh, whether a particular group of that uh, material is going to coalesce into a planet roughly about where ours is, distance from the sun, and predict what are the odds that there's going to be life on it in X million, 100 million, billion years, I think one can make a case that it's probably low. So many things that have to be just right. That's right. Okay, so again, how did life happen? Well, the moment you get to panspermia, it all changes. The math changes. And the idea is like a lottery ticket. If you buy one lottery ticket, your chances right now of winning that stupid jackpot, which they <laughs> now designed to go to a billion dollars, which means that you, you have no chance and the prizes are tiny underneath that. It's nothing but a tax on idiots. You got a one in 190 million chance. So what are the chances you win the lottery? Well, it means you could buy a ticket every day for 190 million days. And not and you win, you know. What if you could buy... 150 million tickets. Oh. What if you could buy 190 million tickets without even getting into the numbers? This has been done. There were several efforts that happened, actually succeeded in uh, in Washington area, something like 30 years ago, where somebody came up with the idea of a team of people with the money, literally going to to, to uh, lottery ticket places all over with lists of n numbers and buying. Attempting to buy every single lottery ticket. No. Yikes! That must have um, taken a lot of time. It worked. Oh, well, but it worked. People, it worked. But it I worked. Mean, they actually wow. won. Wow! Uh, and so eventually they they passed rules. You couldn't do that. But so you buy 190 million lottery tickets, there's a pretty good chance you're going to win the lottery. Well, think of the galaxy mm. as billions of star systems, uh, multi billions of planets. Uh, and if just one of them actually has just the right circumstances for life to emerge on it in the early days, but probably more than one. I mean, when you've got that, you know, when you've got that many, you could, you, 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 know, you could easily win more than once. So you could have a number of planets that actually get this life. And then you've got a lot of activity going on still in the galaxy early on. So you've got things smashing in each other. And so something smashes into one of these life planets. And some of this life is is shot off or carried forward on the surface of an object. In other words, to get life in the entire galaxy, theoretically, you only need one planet to develop life out of the billions of possibilities and have impact events, and we've had them, obviously. And that life, so that like, so in other words, say we were the only planet in the galaxy that had life on it, uh, something like, I forget how many million years, 60 million years, uh, might be 200 million, I forget. And in comes the Chickaloo asteroid. It hits there in the Gulf, massive impact, stuff is shot up into, into space. Now, we understand, at this point, we have a full-fledged biosphere. 
And so that just shoots off into space, and some of these pieces that are going off have got life clinging to it that is able to somehow, one way or another, remain stasis right. during, while it's traveling through space, and it lands somewhere else. You only need one. Over time, it spreads through the galaxy, and that's the numbers game. That, that solves the problem of the primordial soup. Uh, and I would guess that a number of planets were able to do this. And so... Absolutely. I don't like, think we're the just, only only planet on Earth, I mean on Earth, in the galaxy, our planet here on Earth, to have the fundamental building blocks of life. I'm sure oxygen and carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen, all the essential elements exist elsewhere uh, in this uh, galaxy. We, we can't be the only ones, obviously. No, of course not. No, but the point I'm making is yes, they sir. exist. Yeah, I'm all with you. All these things yes. exist elsewhere, but getting life out of inorganic matter, we still, after all these you know years of study, cannot quite get there. How you know? How does a rock? How does a bunch of you know a bunch of basic elements, right? right. Ultimately, through some process, start replicating themselves. It, it's it's it, it, we haven't we tried. I mean, we have we've created experiments to try to duplicate the atmosphere. Of that period, going back several billion years, the primordial soup and all mm -hmm. that, now shoot shoot electric into electricity into it, uh, and it's it's it, the odd still seems seem low, but panspermia is, is exactly how it could happen in the sense that it only has to happen in a few places. It doesn't have to happen in every case. Right, panspermia. Once it gets started, if if you've got impact going on, life starts getting moved around, and if even a little bit of replicating life comes into a planet's uh, uh, into a planet that's got at least probably water. Uh, that's enough. From there, you've already crossed that barrier, right? And off right. you go. So I'm a big. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in, in other words, some people are, you know, big on the Genesis, the Book of Genesis. Right. I'm 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 pretty much big on panspermia, and there isn't a book of panspermia in the Bible, at least not yet. Unfortunately, there isn't. But I mean, that is, in my opinion the most logical and rational explanation of how everything came to be everything that we see in front of us is through panspermia uh, other people could argue with that all day but I'm, I'm still yet to be in my opinion I, I haven't really seen all the other facts that would sort of support their theories on how we came to be but um, moving on from that I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you know that reminds me of uh, some of the things that have been going around here uh, that Grush has uh, pretty much has been very vocal about. And even Tucker Carlson. I'm not a big fan of Tucker, but uh, as me and you both are in, in, the, in the field here, we, we've been talking about this for so long. We're going to consume all media. And uh, Tucker was talking about how something he came across that was very dark. And uh, it has to do with uh, more of the religious aspect of of, of, of all this that's been going on of, of disclosure um, and I'm sure what, you're what what did he come across I mean, well that's something. that's that's the thing he didn't really go into detail because it scared him too much and I'm throwing the quotation marks in the air um, it scared him so much he didn't want to talk about it to his wife and I guess it was just too far out there uh, according to Tucker and I have a feeling it's because of the whole sort of um well, going back to the people in the Pentagon that they were saying um, that these aliens are, are demonic. Look, uh, it's been I've, I have a feeling now. they're wrapped up in all of this. Is is what basically what I'm trying to get get to here. Well, let me just let me just say that you, you want you want people watching your show. You got to say things that get their attention. True. It's one of the. If you're if you're if you're in the fiction business, that's cool. You got a license. You can make you make incredible movies about aliens that scare the hell out of people, and you make you make do a billion dollars. I mean, I get it. But if you're in the nonfiction business, a little tough, tougher. So, the the I the, we have been aware for some time that there is a fundamentalist Christian uh, element within our military. It's turned up from time to time because some some problem developed with it. Air Force Academy had it for a while. I think also with the Pentagon, there's some people in there fundamentalist Christians. And I'm sure it that would not surprise me that 
because uh, you, know, you, you can still be a general or an admiral and be a fundamentalist Christian, right? There's really no, uh, particularly if you're Old Testament, right? You know, it's like if you're New Testament, eh, it's a little tougher. Uh, Jesus wasn't really, you know, big on battle plans and uh, raging hordes, but the Old Testament God was huge on it. In any event, the point is, is that uh, I'm sure that they, they raised these people at times raised the idea that maybe these things are demons. That's it. Okay, that's it. A limited number of fundamentalists at one time or another have raised the concern that maybe they're demons. That's not dark. That's not even a big deal. I, not in my mind either. I mean, that's just their sort of um, takeaway, what they think these things are. I mean, I, I don't think they're demonic. They, but they want. That's okay. Yeah. And, and, and if, if, if enough of them were in high position, they could, they could be a force against disclosure. But the evidence does not, not hold that up. If you're a fundamentalist Christian and you think these are demons, then, then the government's policy of, of, of embargo, which I assure you is not based upon demons, is, is, is comfortable for you. It's like, great, yeah, national security, whatever. If you don't want to tell the people, that's fine with me because I think they're demons. I just hope that isn't the, what's stonewalling all of this. I, the isn't. whole, I mean, come on. I just think that's ridiculous. If that's no, if that's not. the case, if people are going to freak out and things are the world's going to change because uh, aliens exist, I, I think that's I think that's ridiculous. Well, the world is going to change, but the world is not going to it's not it's not going to have revealed to it soon that in fact these ETs are demons all along. Uh, you know, so go read Dante's Inferno. Uh, no, 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 no. Look, the truth embargo thrives on these speculations, right? Uh, which, 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 which are logically, it's human nature to fill up the truth vacuum that the, the truth embargo create it created a giant vacuum, big hole, and uh, you know what happens with that. And so anything, trying to get in there and fill it up, and that helps the truth embargo because what fills it up is mismatch silly stuff in some cases, wild and crazy, or just pure fiction, whatever. Uh, and that's how propaganda works. It right. creates a truth hole, and then it, it, it opens up the ability of others to fill that hole with whatever they want. And that's if it's right. the government doing it, then they'll fill you with a total non-reality. That becomes your truth, vacuum filled. And of course, then the country sails off into oblivion and ends up a pile of smoking rubble. Uh, so the truth embargo created a truth vacuum. And one of the problems of dealing with this issue and being an activist is you've got to, um, how would you say, not go there, step around it, go over it, go under it, go around it. Walk on eggshells, they say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like a it's like a swamp with quicksand. You know, mm -hmm. you don't you don't you don't you know you don't say I'm going to walk straight through this swamp and if I hit quicksand, well, I hit quicksand. No, 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 no. You're going to maneuver all the way around that. And so it, yeah, I've been doing, you know, anybody that's in, in this, certainly politically, you're constantly trying to walk around quicksand, black holes, wormholes, whatever. You have to. And I blame that on the, I don't blame it on the people. I don't blame it on people who have certain thinking or ideas or even ones that completely make it up. It's all, I blame it all on the government. If there's no truth embargo, 90% of the stuff completely disappears. So the government policy is the problem. And of course, the, the truth embargo is nearly over, in my opinion. Pretty close. Uh, there's never, there's never been a time like this before. We've never been closer. Yeah. Um, uh, so much has happened in just three years. It's quite remarkable. And it not is. three easy years. I mean, these have been very difficult years. Uh, trying to move anything politically. Oh, it's yes. It's hard. Th this year, the, the, the Congress had the least productive record and it's uh, second least productive record. They only passed 22 bills, maybe 23. Damn. The worst was 21 under Hoover. And so we're not, politics is not working. Things are not moving forward. It's chaos. It's gridlock, blah, 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 blah. We all, we, and we're reminded of that every day. Yeah. And yet the, 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 the policy or the truth disclosure process, the structure, the legislation and other things has been moving forward fairly steadily. In spite of that, with tons of media coverage, which is a good uh, indicator. Very good thing. 
it's over. It's, it's just about over. And we'll, things loosen up at all. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to this issue with the truth embargo in a second. I, I wanted to bring up the fact that I actually I found the, the clip I was talking about. Now. I'll play that now for you in, in regards. Yeah, let's play that ideas were wrong and I think that some of them were right is is what I'm learning and I you know I'll just leave it there the second thing that bothers me is the UFO story and uh, you know the more you dig into that and talk to people with knowledge with actual knowledge of it again that's a, another story where there are some you know fanciful ideas floating around that are just you know there's no evidence that they're true but if you talk to people who you know have actual knowledge of it that they gathered themselves there are parts of that story that I do not understand at all that are really 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 dark it's so dark that I you know haven't told my wife about it I mean I, I haven't verified any of this but this is not just stuff that I read on the internet. I know you all are very, very grounded in that story. So I think I know, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. but there's some stuff there that's just like, man, I, I'm not even sure what that means. There's a spiritual component there that I, I don't fully understand. Um, so yes, that story bothers me. And I think last thing I'll say that one of the reasons that we've had all the, these disclosures and all these, what, 10 whistleblowers at this point, and it hasn't really become front page news. Part of it's suppression you know, parts of the government don't want you to know about it, but part of it is the public can't deal with it. It's too far out. The implications are too um, profound. And so, and I understand that because I've heard things where I'm just like, oh man, I, I don't even really want to know that. Mm, uh, yeah, honestly, deeply so, disturbing stuff, you know, forget like saucers you know I mean? and technology. It's yeah, deeply, yeah. No, deeply no, no, no. disturbing stuff. stuff that I haven't even told Natalie. Yep. I agree with you. It's so disturbing. Exactly. I can't even tell my kids. My kids ask me different stories about it. And I, I won't say yeah, it because no, no. it's so dark. <laughs> it's I so agree. dark. I yeah. totally agree. Miles is watching. So. Okay, Miles, if you're watching the show, Daddy's yeah. not going to tell you about that part of the UFO <laughs> stuff and what's going on with the government. Well, can, and that can, can I say one thing? I, I'm, they've known clearly. I mean, this is, I think, established, and I feel comfortable saying this as fact. The U.S. government, I mean, these are real, whatever they are. They're not human. And the government has known that for a long time, possibly going back to the 1930s at least. And, of course, there's tons of evidence in the written record, in the physical record, in paintings um, and, in the, and in literature that people have been seeing and interacting with these things for a long time. So we know that. But the justification one often hears is, well, the government the government, various presidents who have been read in, not all have been, um, haven't wanted to disclose this because it would scare people. And I've always thought that's that's bullshit. You know, you're hiding a crime, which they are, by the way, in my opinion. Right. Um, but I do think there's a sense in which that's not totally crazy. Like there is some stuff, if it's true, and I'm kind of thinking it may be true, that's so radical that... Um, yeah, well, as we both said, we you know don't want to tell the people we love most about it because like why would you, you know, disturb someone like that? So I kind of get that. I hate to. Admit I don't like that, by the way. That whole mindset of the the American people are gonna it's too much for them. They can't handle the truth. I mean, I hate hearing people say that. Oh, uh, he's 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 he's. Look, you're gonna go if you if you're a journalist, you're gonna go on in front of a camera, right? And say you've heard things that are very disturbing. So disturbing, I can't tell my wife, and I can't tell you, but I'm telling you, it's disturbing. <laughs> That's not journalism. I agree. Right? And it's 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 uh, the one thing he did say was that it's bullshit. That was the, that the, the thing he got right there was definitely it's bullshit. Um, and the, the, this whole idea that people can't handle the truth was was one of the core uh, threads of uh, the of the truth embargo. Uh, and it was it was bullshit from the beginning. In other words, the people that work in the Pentagon or the CIA, they're relatively smart. Not all of them. Uh, and there are plenty of people in various parts of government. Guys on the crash retrieval team. Some of them are just high school grads. So the people who work in government can handle it. We can't. That was BS from day one. I agree. American people had just gone through an unbelievable difficult time. Not to mention what the Russian people had went through. Yeah. And so the idea that the Russian people, after defeating the Nazis and losing 20 million people, are going to lose their mind if they learn that we're not alone in the universe is nonsense. It's always been nonsense. It's a condescending, patriarchal, you know, in loco parentis uh, view that the government is our parent and we are just children, if not pets. Right. And, it's, and, and, and I, I repudiate it completely. It's insanity. 
and 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 Hucker was saying some things though about what we know, which is great, and I I, I don't want to. I, I'm glad he's saying those things, but there are plenty of people who were saying those things 25 years ago, right? 30 years ago. He's finally gotten to it great. Okay. But his lack of, he doesn't have the knowledge base of most of my colleagues, but he has the audience. Okay, great. I'm glad that they're doing that. They need to bring more people on that know more about this history that can, how would you say, respond more intelligently to that statement. But they're not ready to do that. Though, though they are getting some people on. Rush has been on. Nolan has been on. When Nolan went on Tucker, he said there was an extraterrestrial presence. Flat out. Good. I love that. But let's be clear. The issue is incredibly complicated. The history is complicated. Quantum mechanics is complicated. Life is complicated. Right? Uh, so... What's new about complicated? Nothing. That's what we've been dealing with for our entire existence as homo sapiens sapiens. Increasingly complicated stuff. And now we've got supercomputers and AI that will make it possible for us to even understand more than we ever could on our own. So learning and finding out things is what we do in terms of uh, conducting our affairs and managing the, the needs and welfare of people. Well, we're not so good at that. But in terms of dealing with more and more complicated stuff, oh yeah, we're good at that. So look, there's so much rough coverage and statements out there that I'm not gonna lose it over that. It, the, the journalism has covered this issue, but it has never investigated it. Uh, only independents have done that without any big journalistic en en entities behind them. Though that's improving without without question uh, and there's so many so much missing pieces to the puzzle that we're trying to put together that it's confusing and awkward and the puzzle is going to be a pretty big puzzle it's going to be big great you know because the standard uh, affairs of men are starting to get awfully repetitive and boring right? right right and that's uh, what's going on right now with with uh, disclosure you know some people have grown fatigued over over the matter and you know i admit I, i've been getting slightly fatigued myself but i, I fully and firmly uh, acknowledge and, and recognize that there has been substantial progress made though and disclosure is just not gonna sort of uh, come to us that quickly even though it, it really briefly has uh, to a certain degree, there's been some somewhat of disclosure already, already a happening. Disclosure, small d, yeah, yes. sure. We've had revelations and material coming forward for decades, but not the major now, thing yet. Yeah, but disclosure that we, uh, I'm concerned with is confirmation. That's Kevin. right, right. That's what we At need. The event that's what we haven't had, and uh, and but we had plenty of small d disclosure, right? Uh, increasingly so, uh, uh, accelerating in the last three years, which is what you expect toward the end. You get near the end of a race and you see the finish line, you get a burst of energy and you, know, you go running across it. I've been there, done that. Um, and so that's happening. Um, and it's inevitable. It had to happen. And clearly the signs are that it's probably going to happen very soon and needs to happen very soon. Uh, and then, the real small d disclosure process gets underway only the the wind will be at our back uh the public will have substantial power all the entire journalistic con community will join come over to our side I and mean, it will be totally with us all the way uh covering everything investigating and pulitzer prizes grabbing them here there whatever and the government will be up against really a unified opposition or at least opposition to more embargo uh and so that's why i believe that after disclosure the u.s government at least and i think some others as well are going to enter a rather interesting place that they have not spent much time and, and that is the truth zone i think that telling the truth is going to become not only required essential but mandated in, in other words, post-disclosure, the age of systemic lying 
it's going to be over for a while, maybe forever. But there will be some that will mistakenly think that, no, no, it's back to business as usual. Yeah, there's extraterrestrials here. Now, here's another load of bullshit, I'm going to tell you, in order to protect my interest, increase my net worth, or just piss you off. And unfortunately, that's not going to work. Uh, because now we are in the age of global citizen networking, uh, unlike anything the world has ever seen. Only took 25 years to develop. Only 25 years, yes. Mosaic and Netscape, Internet, uh, World Wide Web, so forth, bulletin boards, email, uh, 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 and then, of course, the social media. Facebook in 2003, Twitter in 2006, other social media, Instagram, TikTok, what have you. And then the development of what amounts to an AI kind of thing, uh, massive, improving, ever improving translation software, solving the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel has finally been fixed. Uh, there's virtually no website in the world you can't go to and translate on the major browsers like Chrome. You're interested in some Koreans research on UFOs, go to the website, con convert it to English immediately. And so you've got this massive neurosphere that T.R. Duchardin was talking about back in the 50s, where the planet is literally a thinking thing, where there's so much interconnections and possibilities that information can move incredibly fast. Something could go viral here and then spread around the world. And people have access to it all. The podcast revolution is just the latest version. Cheaper cameras, cheaper uh, uh, um, uh, 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 microphones, B cheaper but better quality cameras, microphones, computers, uh, and then of course networking software, podcasting software, e e DIY, YouTube videos where you can learn anything. All of this has created a massive global citizen journalistic sphere in a sense where at any time millions of people could focus on one thing. Uh, you, on Twitter, you can have something tr tr trending on a day. It could have 100, 200, 300,000 postings. You don't know, but it just depends on how powerful it is. Right. That is the world we live in now. And so some fool that goes out in front of a microphone and says, uh, it, you know, confirms the ET presence and then comes up with some complete lie for pure convenience with that many people watching and the power of the net available to them, sort of a, a planet of fact checkers. It's also a planet of bullshitters, but it's also a planet of fact checkers. They're going to take that statement. They're going to run it around this, you know, the internet about a thousand times in about five minutes, and they're going to come back at them with some postings, and the person's probably going to be unemployed. I'm serious about this. We, we, we are we are seeing some of that developing, but it's a it's a mixed bag. For every every bolt piece of BS that gets run to ground, another piece turns up, and I get it. There's not a no one thing has massive focus, but the ET issue will be different. The disclosure of the extraterrestrial presence, not just the existence of the ETs, but the lie, the misrepresentation, the Orwellian misrepresentation that's three quarters of a century long, is going to wake up the internet like you've never seen. And they're going to say, look, you know, forget, you know, Q. I mean, Q is just a deep, dark well where, where crazy people lie to each other for sport. I'm talking about in the very public sector. And so you're a spokesperson for the Department of Defense, for the White House, for the NASA, for the Agriculture Department, whatever, CDC, and, and you ought to get in front of a microphone and tell a bold-faced lie. You're going to be telling them to a different world post-disclosure, and it's going to, you're going to pay a heavy price. And so truth will become the deferred option, meaning tell the truth, no problems. Now, you can still get trolled. People that don't want to hear the truth will give you a hard time. Right. But their power is far less than the people that know you're lying and are giving you a hard time. And Mr. Bassett, you know, you, you're someone who has basically the, the crosshairs on, on their back. Uh, you, you've been uh, ridiculed on the Internet. Uh, too on, much. Uh, well, you know, they, they go after you at times. They, they say, oh, he's too optimistic. He's... He said it's just around the corner. I, it, these are things that people online, uh, they repeat about you all the time. And I, I wanted you to sort of address these folks that, you know, they spew these things at you. Well, you're, I think you're overstating spew. No, nah, they're, they're, 
they're, they're demonstrating a certain impatience with my optimism. That's this is true. hardly trolling. Do you know how bad trolling can get? Have you ever seen somebody that was really getting hammered? No, I have got it made. I'm, I'm, I'm just skating through the Internet. Uh, and now, that could stop tomorrow. You know, uh, you say one thing wrong, and the next thing you know, they're coming for you. I'm not going to succumb to that. I mean, they can come for me. It doesn't matter. I'm not going with them. But the thing is, is that, is that no, 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 no. I, I've actually been very pleased and never really particularly disturbed with uh, how people uh, have, have, have viewed my, my work. I get an overwhelming uh, percentage of supportive statements. Very rare. Is it negative? And that's fine. Any, anybody that thinks, well, I do have two flaws, which I've overcome as an older man, right? And these are character flaws, which which are a problem. One of them is I want everybody to like me. And worse, I want everybody I know to like each other. Mm. Now, this is not the real world. Okay? No. This is kind of a fantasy Unfortunately world. Unfortunately not. It's, it, it's kind of a... You know, it's just a personal thing, so, you know, and, and it's best to get over that, and I, I have, all right? And so... And how did you get over it, that, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? Perspective and common pers- sense. Okay, okay. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're living in a tiny little town, and you've got a few friends and some neighbors, right, uh, and you know, it's a good chance that you could have a well-defined reputation, uh, you would either be the town idiot or you could be the you know the really super nice guy, but overall it's going to be well defined. But even then, there'll be some people who don't like you. Oh, absolutely! And you're, you're talking 20. to someone who who's been doxxed and harassed, uh, Mr. Bassett. So you're you're in good company. I mean, they sure, haven't done sure. that to you, but okay, you know, people are nasty. That's all I'm so, saying. But yeah, well, yeah, you know they are. You know that. Yeah. I'm just saying, if you're going to be public, if you're going to interact with millions of people, right, right, and you're thinking. That everyone's going to love you. Be happy. Yeah, with, yeah. Everybody's going to be comfortable with you. Everybody's going to like what you have to say. That's insanity. Yeah. Okay. That's it, nuts. it completely disregards the complexity of the human mind and human experience. And so, it, it absolutely you're going to no matter what, right? No matter what, you're going to have people that are not going to like you, and the internet makes it possible for them to tell you. I mean, this is a simple. The simplest way to put the situation now. Very simple concept, right? And the response right. to it is, is simple. You do not argue with people in social space. You do not argue with people that attack you. Even if it rises to the level of defamation, in the internet world, and the social media world, it's virtually impossible to, to somehow counter defamation. All you can do, keep your mouth shut. Sometimes you might correct a fact. Right. If they say, well, you know, you were molesting children in such and such a city in 1949, you just point out, well, I've never been to that city and I wasn't right. alive in 1949, something like that. Correct with that. Yeah. And getting into a thing, it's impossible. Uh, that is the nature of the world now. So and then the other thing is, yeah, and the reason you don't respond to. Yeah, somebody, I don't engage with those people either. Yeah. OK. That's so crazy. You don't respond to people that attack you. Yeah. It's because there is nothing good that can come from it. It cannot help you at all. At all. That's right. Uh, and arguing about things, political views or whatever, well, it's it's one thing in, in a more family setting or more amongst friends, you can have arguments about yeah. positions, uh, and but you know them, you have disagreements. Right, right. Whatever. But when you start arguing with strangers mm. in a public setting where you're arguing over some issue and, 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 and a number, any number of thousands of people can, can watch this, it, it's never going to go well. It just doesn't work. And so you, just, just, you have to just shove that aside. And so, yeah, somebody not liking me doesn't bother me much. I mean, I, I take a note of it. And once in a while, somebody will have a problem, and they'll come back at you. It would be preferable if they DM'd, right? That's what you're supposed to do if you can. I have DM on my Twitter. So if someone has a problem with me, I would prefer that they DM me and say, look, here's the issue. But, yeah, the nature is it's like, put it out there. So now you have a public thing, right? They have a problem with you, and everybody gets to know the problem they have. Right. All right. So... 
but you can you can DM you can direct message on Facebook you can direct me message on Twitter. It's one of the reasons I have DM, right? Not everybody does. Um, and so, and once people will come up and I'll, and and they're right, they're absolutely right, and I I will I will respond accordingly. Uh, so these are just the things you have to do to be a public person in the age of the internet, social journalism, and uh, and uh, the, the massive networking uh, capability we have. And those that, that understand it, uh, they fare okay. And there's a lot of great stuff you can do. Those that don't, they have a terrible time. That's right. So there you go. I, so I, 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 I embrace the activist power of the social media and networking system that evolved in a very short amount of time, starting in mid 1990. I'm glad you have a, a positive outlook on, on this as well, by the way, uh, Mr. Bassett. Yeah. And I don't mean that as a, you know, no pun intended. Um, I think that's great that you do handle it this way. And I'm glad I brought it up because I don't think I've heard you ever really talk about that sort of issue uh, anywhere else. So I'm glad I mentioned this to you because obviously uh, you're well aware of all these fools out there. No, I wouldn't use that term, right? Oh, well, I, I would. I mean, I like to, you know. Fighting. I like the I like the fighting, but that's a whole other issue. Um, I'll, you know, I'll be cool here. I want to get them all riled up. Um, but I could go deeper into this, but I will leave it there, my friend. Um, one other thing I did want to mention to you was in respects to the whole UFO phenomenon, UAP phenomenon. I, I wanted to get into the, the darker stuff, as they say. The uh, abduction scenario, uh, this is something I've never really heard you talk about uh, at any length, to be honest. Maybe I, mu I must have missed it. No, but... you, you just haven't. You have, believe me, I talk about it often, but I've done God knows how you know, maybe 2,000 interviews, so you haven't seen but I, I just I, never I, heard you talk about uh, the whole abduction scenario, and we've heard all these stories of abductions for years and years, mm -hmm. and we've also heard how it's some say it, it's known that the government could possibly be involved in faked alien abductions. And you've heard this from several groups of people. We've heard the story right. about the UFO black ops, human trafficking by the former Marine, uh, Michael Herrera, I believe. I, I'm just curious what your thoughts and opinions on these sort of issues are. If you think there's extraterrestrials abducting people, or do you think more along the lines of it being more of a uh, government operation? There is a massive program that pretty much centers around genetics. Uh, and, and genetics is complicated, and there's a lot of ways that it could be in, uh, part of this. But it's a massive program uh, dealing with humans. This program is almost certainly for the benefit of the XDTs, but we don't know what that benefit is. We can only guess. Uh, it, in call, in, it involves taking people. Sometimes they want to go, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they handle it well, sometimes they don't. What else is new? And two men can go off to the same exact war, have the same exact experiences. One comes back and has PTSD and ends up sleeping on the sidewalk. Right. Another comes back, goes to college, ends up with a PhD and, and, and become president of the university. Uh, it's how you react to things that mm. ultimately determines how well your life goes. Same for nations. Uh, it's how a nation reacts to things, not what happens to it. that ultimately determines how that nation fares. This is one of the most fundamental laws, I think, of, of the human condition, whether it be individual or whether it be institutional, that unfortunately is just simply not observed enough. But, uh, and then there is a small, there may be a small, very modest program probably not, not, not active, where government tried to learn what was going on, uh, what ETs were saying and doing with, with, with people by uh, grabbing them in some way, interrogating them, and then using some pretty powerful drugs that they have, some of which are completely classified, to maybe knock the memory out, maybe even induce a memory, and create right. what would be a a fake abduction, particularly if, if there are an abductee and they know it, and they it's going to be pretty easy to sort of convince them that under significant being drug, yeah, that false memory, mm -hmm. and and this is the way they can get information. Now, I don't think it's an extensive program. 
And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's hard to do. It's complicated, difficult, somewhat risky. Two, um, the, the government is huge. It has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people working in it. Millions, actually, totally. But in terms of the military intelligence complex, several hundred thousand. And so there are and have been contactees, abductees working in government with high classified status. What does that mean? So if you've got a colonel uh, who is in a highly classified position within, the, say, the Department of Defense or a military service, and it becomes known to you that this colonel is a contactee, you're not going to take them in a room and drug them. In fact, you're going to treat them well. Right? You know, you're going to give them a, an upgrade his car, uh, give them a bonus salary, and what have you. And you and you bring them in to and say, look, uh, we we need your assistance. We need to know what it is like being a contactee, what is happening, what are they saying to you, and that, that person will be probably happy to do it because they're not going to be threatened. They're going to be treated as a major resource. So they've, they've had contactees within their own structures for some time. They don't have to go out and, and play games with, with humans. But I think early on they might have done that uh, before they had access to inside, classified, already classified, therefore safe. In other words, you know, you're, everything is classified, safe's not going anywhere. Your job's going to be just fine. You're helping us out. Hey, we may even get up you in rank. So they just don't need. But I think it existed for a while, just like we, we had, we've we had at various times remote viewing programs existing and other uh, psychic research. And so sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably one of it. Not, not a particularly positive uh, aspect of the truth embargo, all for national security, of course. Uh, but to get more back to the major point, being alive is pain. It's, it's difficult. Life it's, is pain. It's not fun, you know. It uh, for the vast majority of people, it's it's not a sleigh ride at all. No. And and even for those who have everything, it could become awful. That's right. The, there's a long list of very wealthy people that are utterly miserable. Take very miserable, right? It's a tough gig. Everything's going along, and then along comes Hitler, and the next thing you know, it's hell for seven years. And so one of the uh, things that some people are facing, having been born into this world, is dealing with aliens. Uh, and, and, and the one thing I can say about that is everything that I know about that experience, which comes from talking to people that have been through it, not that there aren't, and there's plenty to read about it. Sure. Is that what the aliens, are the, I'm, I mean, aliens is a term that I don't like to use, what the uh, extraterrestrials are doing with contactees does not even begin to rise to what humans do to each other. There's almost nothing that humans won't do to each other. Every awful thing you can imagine, we've done it and we do it. So it doesn't even come close to that. So, that's point number one. Point number two, it is, it is almost serving some important purpose for them. This is not something you do just for the hell of it. Right. Right. There is a very serious reason why they're doing that. Um, and, and which includes, by the way, animal mutilation. Almost certainly the animal mutilations are about getting certain types of biological material that they need. Uh, not, they're just not collecting cow blood. Right, right. right? So they're... They need these materials almost certainly connected to the work they're doing with humans. So in terms of what a, any, any individual contactee can go through, it can run the gamut from this is fantastic to this is hell. Yeah, there's a nightmare. And, 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 and so obviously the ones that are handling it badly, I, I have nothing but sympathy for. And the, the worst thing, of course, is that even if, even if you're enjoying it, even if it's something you look forward to, you're still going to be ridiculed if you talk about it, so you have to stay in the closet. But the ones that are going through hell who have no recourse at all uh, and have to live in a closet because they can't even talk about it, which is less so, uh, these, are, these are people. But guess what? We have a lot of people living in closets. That's true. Lots. 
people living in the closets. Oh yeah, and and it's not a pl good fun place to be. And then they come out and they and they get doxxed and, and 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 it takes a long time for that closet to be closed. Uh, there aren't too many groups of closeted people of size, though there's still plenty of pushback against those that have come out. The ET contactees are one of the last group, but they're just about ready to come out. And, and unlike most closeted groups, uh, using that metaphor, the ET closeted people, the contactee closeted people, are going to have the best time once we're there. When they come out, see, in, in, in generally the way things go is that society makes people live in a closet because these people are not acceptable to the general society. Eventually, right. through various means, they come out, laws change. But once they come out, people are still giving them a hard time. Yeah, you're out, but we don't like you, you know? That's not the case here. When the contactees come out of the closet, people are going to welcome them with open arms. Okay? It was the government keeping in there, not so much society per se. The government's policy was designed to put them in that closet, not so much social mores or peer pressure. And so once the ET presence is confirmed, everybody's going to want to want to know a contactee. Everybody's going to want to talk to them. And they're going to be so thrilled that they're coming forward. Now, some are going to fake it, and that's going to pollute the issue a little bit. But they're going to be welcome with open arms. And I'm going to enjoy the hell out of that, watching that happen. I'm not a contactee, but I know plenty. And uh, right. these people are going to become a huge information source for the world. Because they're everywhere. Right? So they're coming out everywhere and talking and giving their experiences. And people are learning and, and, and getting a sense of it. And if they had a bad experience, they'll, they'll say that. If it was a wonderful experience, they'll say that. And so when you just view it that way... How, how bad is that? You know, how, how bad is that? Is it, is it worse than the Holocaust survivors that were freed up at the end of World War II and the stories they told when they came back to the United States or to their home countries? Is it worse than that? No. Is it that bad? No. It's far less than that. So we know what that's like. We've seen it. And we value it. Steven uh, Spielberg, uh, as part of his uh, Schindler List movie, uh, around that same time, he was also making a huge documentary. I think the name is Shoah, but I'm not sure. But essentially, he was spending a great deal of money to interview as many Holocaust survivors as possible, because mm. even at the time that this was happening, which is around 19, the 1990s, I think, when Schindler came out, um, early 1990s. Um, they were dying off rapidly. And so he went and got their story. And so to preserve. Well, we're going to do the same thing with contactees. Yeah, that was back in 93, I believe. And 93. Mm -hmm. Whitley, Whitley Strieber's gotten 500,000 letters, all of those. I mean, there'll be plenty of people to, to interview. And, and, and so you will see... More people come forward. People projects in which contactees mm -hmm. are put on record. There are, it's already happening, but I mean, more, more organized, more thorough. Eventually, I, I think you're going to have several million contactees on record uh, in film form, archived, uh, if not put into some content production for public consumption, but also I think just in general to have the archive, because this, this is the firsthand experience. This is firsthand information of what ETs are doing, saying, thinking, behaving. And boy, do we want to know that and, until such time as the ETs can have open contact with us and just hand us giant, well, you know, some DVD or you know, an ET DVD that has like 400 billion records on it. Uh, until then, the contactees are, are, are the interface. And knowing their experience will be incredibly important to history. In other words, this is the record of the modern engagement of extraterrestrials with human civilization. It's not ancient aliens. It's not the episodes of the deep past, which I'm pretty sure happened. I'm glad you brought up ancient aliens really quickly here. Um, yeah. What exactly are your thoughts and opinions on the television show um, Ancient Aliens? Uh, again, I've, I've never heard you ever refer to that, uh, that show until right now. So I'm curious, what do you think of this show? <laughs> 
Once again, my friend, <laughs> you need you need to spend more time watching all of my videos. I uh, do. I I, <laughs> I I mean, I I have to uh, do a lot, but uh, I know I should be watching much more of you, Mr. Bassett. Obviously, but again, hey, I've been hearing you for years since I was a child, Mr. Bassett, and you know, I've always, oh, I've oh, always. Jesus. Now you. Really... I don't mean to date you. I don't mean to date you, but I'm just saying I've always backed you, my friend. Uh, everywhere I go, people. You know, they say, well, Mr. Bassett, this, child. Mr. No. I know I'm like, you're like my, uh, you're almost like my, my grandfather of sorts. Okay. Now I'm really feeling fine. I'm uh, sorry. I, I'm sorry. I went there. No, Ancient <laughs> Aliens is fantastic. I love it. Yes, show. sir. It's an incredibly good show. It's, 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 it's extraordinary. It, it can, it, it sprung from the mind of Kevin Burns and George Sukwokas. Uh, who, I love George Lucas. I wish I could hang with him. He, he just, he's just, he's always traveling somewhere. He's he, always busy. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't hang with George, but uh, I did meet Kevin Burns before he died. Oh yes. Rest in peace. And so working from George Lucas's incredible uh, journalism, writing, you know, publishing at legendary times for years. Uh, and then drawing back on some of the most prolific of the early investigators, Von Danik and Sitchin and so forth. They started to develop the idea of let's go look at history, hopefully with a, an open mind, and look for anything, any clues whatsoever that have ET connections. It's like an investigator going to a crime scene, right. looking for any clues that could point to what happened. Right? I think he's done well. You know, Giorgio has done great with the, with the television show, no doubt. But of course, there there's always those other people, those unsavory characters that want to interject. Uh, you know, very fanatical things. I mean, the whole cowboys and aliens uh, thing that went on a couple years back. I thought that was really bad. Cowboys and aliens? What are you referring to? There was they did a, a, a well. There's a movie. Well, the movie. I've yes, seen the movie. But, yeah, but ancient, that to do with ancient aliens. They brought it in that aspect into the show. Oh, oh, oh! Well, look, ETs have been around. Oh, absolutely. I, but I just thought, and, why, why go there though? Well, because it, it because why not? Right. And it, again, you don't think that kind it, of muddied the water a little bit, though, slightly look, the, 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 with the movie thing. If, if you're if you're you're making content. Sure. You're yeah, making yeah. content and you're looking at stuff. OK, they're not. A, it's not an activist. It's not a wing of the activist empire. Or what, it, is, it is a program designed to entertain and go look at stuff. And so they shouldn't have any restrictions at all. They have no obligation to me to muddy or not muddy the water and do whatever they want. Uh, and by and large, compared to a lot of content, it turns up, uh, it's not problematic. So they've gone and they've looked at everything they can looking for that ET connection, right? Biased in that sense. There's, they're, they're, not, they're not trying to, to be a, a, a master class in archaeology, anthropology. They're, right, they're saying, right. look, we're going in the past and we're looking for anything with an ET connection because we're pretty sure that since they're here now, they've been here before. Sure. Not exactly a, a giant leap. And guess what? When you do that, you find it everywhere. And they do. They find it everywhere. And in the earlier shows, I think uh, they might, I, I, I think, I don't know. I, I, I think that overall, it's been pretty solid. I'm sure there's no question that a couple of things, it's, some of the things that they, they, they connected the dots on, that there's no connection there. So they're, they're seeing what could be a connection, and it's not there. That's okay. That's okay. You only have to find one instance, if you could literally prove it, where ETs are interacting with ancient humans. <laughs> that makes it a massive deal. And so they'll, they'll miss one, and then the critics dive in and go, well, I, you know, let me, I'm an anthropologist, and let me explain exactly what that is. And here it turns out, yeah, it's not ET. And they go, well, that means the whole show is nonsense. Well, again. Well, yeah, know? that's not the point of the show, though. Obviously, yeah, one of the shows is to yeah. look for possibilities it's to open and... you up to yeah for the idea. Sure, I, I get that one hundred percent. I'm with you all the way. I just thought it was kind of strange that they did the whole promotional thing with the movie. That's all. I just thought I, I just thought they didn't really need to do that. But again, it's all for content, and I, it's, it's, I'm with it's you though. Entertainment. Yeah, it's, it's entertainment. entertainment. Oh, I love. Trust it's me, money. I'm with it. I'm with it. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. it's okay. In other words, the truth embargo is conditioned people to look for every little thing that they could get upset about. Yeah, and I know. They can back away from it. I don't. I, I don't play by the truth embargoes games. They've set up a bunch of rules, and I want to violate every single one of them. And I'm with I'm you. Not play their game. That's why okay. I like you, uh, Mr. Bassett. Yeah. So. so Ancient aliens. Not, not only does it does it give you unbelievable 
survey of the ancient world. They spent a fortune on all these trips and cameras, and you get to see all these sites and everything. Right? It's it's like a trip around the world all the time. True. It's it's an absolutely incredible show, and and uh, it is probably done it more than any other nonfiction content introduced the idea of an extraterrestrial presence to more people than any other nonfiction thing, period. The, the fictional versions of extraterrestrials have surpassed that. In other words, 600 movies uh, of the uh, within the much larger science fiction genre since 52, about 600. I haven't checked lately, but it was 400 and something as of 2010. have had extraterrestrials in them, uh, with the technology making it increasingly more realistic. Uh, they have did highest grossing movies in history. They've made untold billions of dollars. I estimate total revenues from all sources, maybe as high as $200 billion now for the film industry. God bless the film industry. Uh, and these films always do, the big ones always do twice as much overseas. In other words, they'll do 90 million here. They'll do 180 million overseas. Right. So, the movies we make, the modern movies we make about extraterrestrials, are being seen everywhere by billions of people. That has done the most to bring the idea of non-humans in this galaxy, in this world, to the world than anything else. Uh, safe, fictional, obviously, mostly dangerous, you know, bad aliens, but not all. Uh, but the idea of an extraterrestrial is universally accepted. In that sense, it's concept. It's 100. percent You have you have to go to the deepest forest uh, and the and the most remote parts of the planet to find somebody that goes extraterrestrial alien. I, I do not understand. I, right. I so that's number one. After that, in, in the nonfiction world, totality of the nonfiction world is pretty powerful. But within the nonfiction world, number one, ancient aliens introduced tens and tens and tens of millions of people to the idea, not only, but of not of fictional ETs, but of real ETs, and in a safe way, because they're, they're gone now. They were there then, but they're not here now, and so it's safe, it's comfortable, and you just enjoy it. You get a lot of, lot of you know, travel, and you get to see archaeological sites. Yeah, it's a great show, and I've even brought in Robert Clotworthy, by the way. He's the uh, voiceover guy for the, yes, for the yes. show. He's a great guy. Love the guy. He's a great guy, mm -hmm. incredible guy, and a uh, nice guy, and also just an amazing voice. And I, I oh, think yeah. he's got rich as hell off this. I hope he has. I think he has, yeah. I think he's made I a killing. I've one time. So, again, I am a huge Ancient Aliens fan. I think ultimately it will be viewed as a very significant component of ending the truth embargo, just chipping away one show at a time, bada bing, bada bam, bada boom, bada bing, bada bam, never letting up. Eventually, the archaeologists and the anthropologists gave up. You know, it's like, what? In other words, everybody's watching this show. Nobody gives a shit about their work. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Publish a paper, 10 people read it. And then they just gave up and said, just do your damn archaeology. There yeah, is yeah there, archaeology. there were a lot of people uh, in, the, in that world, the archaeology uh, world, or archaeological sort of uh, world. And anthropological. And anthrop yes, and they were, you know, they were pushing back. Um, they were saying, well, that's impossible. There's no way uh, these uh, Giorgio's out of his mind. He's making these calculations that are ridiculous. I've been out there. They're not nearly as sharp as he claims they are, these, um, some of these structures. I, I've heard it all, and I'm sure you have as well, obviously. But, yeah, I get it. I get it. And again, the truth embargo basically was saying all the time that everybody that touches this issue is nuts. Yeah, and right. If somebody nuts is talking about your subject, well, you've got to step in. And again, they bought into the truth embargo. Right? And, 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 uh, one of the things that I've repeated many times, and, 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 it, and I think it's me, I think I got this phrase, I got this one, I'm not sure. But it's uh, one way or another, the truth embargo makes fools of us all. Everybody, government, military, the archeologist, Harvard, the Harvard, you know, uh, uh, the, the, whoever runs Harvard, uh, the activist, me, people in the field, journalists, it makes a fool of everybody because when you when you create a distortion of reality that big and hold it on for that long everybody's going to get screwed right yeah what can i say that's just the way it is and so one has to be humbled by that right so 
So those are strutting around there thinking that it hasn't made a fool of them and they're pontificating on their position and doxing other people and trolling and whatever the hell. They don't they didn't get it. They, they don't. And and, and and Mr. Bass, let me just ask you this. After all 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 that's said and done, all these years you put into this, was it worth it for you? Oh God, yes. I would have to agree. Yeah, you're, you're, you're the only one, my friend. We, we need people like you is what I'm trying to get to. I'm not the only one. They're, yeah, they're you're more, not the only one, back. but you've been at it. And, and that says a lot more than the other people at home that just sit there and criticize you because you've actually gone and done something about it. And they're just they're just sitting there um, tweeting. Uh, they're just tweeting or on on Reddit or something. First of all, there's not that many people criticizing me. I mean, oh, well, there isn't, but, I'm, you know, proportion, right? There's not that many. And, and the ones that I don't that's fine. At least they're paying attention, and the ones that don't even know who I am, I don't care. It's okay, because there's 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 a huge people. You see all these books behind me? That's a tiny fraction of all the books that have been printed. There's there's huge numbers of people in the citizen science journalism activist world that has been pushing this issue forward, uh, running into the wind, hamstrung, with not much money, uh, and thus the truth embargo would, 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 was maintained. Uh, it's not an issue of the nature that that millions of people will take to the streets right right and 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 demanding the resignations of uh, and riot diversity. i mean that, that'd be something else though if there were riots and they were caused because uh, people wanted full disclosure on the on the subject matter i mean that would be pretty nuts yeah it would be because it would be ridiculous uh people riot when the government is handling itself so badly that inflation goes to 10,000 percent right people riot when uh the, the, the food runs out people riot when they're being assaulted and beat up by by the state and things like that these are personal visceral things right that's what take, puts people in the street people do not riot over disagreements between scientists about quantum mechanics this issue is very intellectual very complicated and removed from the daily life of people with the exception of contactees. If anybody was going to march on Washington, it would be the contactees. Mm, but right. again, it's hard to march on Washington when you, you're living in a closet. And so, and, and again, you, you'd be diminished. It, it happened with the Civil War. With, with, I, I was involved somewhat in the, in, in the anti-Vietnam War movement and, and the huge marches that took place. And uh, the reason that people were prepared to march with their feet was that young men were being drafted into the military and sent off to Asia. Right. Uh, and that, that definitely gets your attention. Uh, kids were pulled out of school or whatever. It was, it was uh, pretty intense, very personal. And so they marched in huge numbers. And in the, in the earliest days of the anti-war movement, one of the ways that the mainstream society push back is to diminish and demean and call them fools and idiots and crazy and hippies, misguided, communists, whatever. Demean them. Yeah, very awful. Think, yeah. And so, and, and, but in spite of that, believe me, they were going to march. And I, I, I attended a couple marches in Washington that were easily in the five, 500,000 range. Uh, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. I would imagine. So, so this issue, one of the reasons that, see, the Vietnam War only lasted about 20 years. Wait, wait a minute. It lasted really about that. Uh, yeah, about It lasted uh, too long. No, 15 years. It lasted about 15 years. The, the reason that this issue is particularly difficult is because you, it is not an issue that people are going to vote with their feet. They're not. There's been a couple of attempts to do a little of that picketing kind of stuff. It's utterly, it, it, I mean, I love the effort, but it had, had no chance. Right. Effect. It's going nowhere. People are not going to be able to push back in that way, but you're still going to get ridiculed. In other words, if you're, if you're, if there's 200,000 of you out there, somebody wants to ridicule you from the side, screw them. There's 200,000 of us. But in this issue, you can't really come together on, on Moss. Uh, and so everyone's kind of isolated. This is whether you're a journalist, whether you're a documentarist, general, you're kind of isolated. And, and there were groups that were formed, and there and there and some exist. MUFON is a group of people that, that are essentially a group spread out, but it's still a group. 
Nightcap came together, very powerful group, but they, they, and too powerful. They, they had to destroy it, and they did in the late 60s. Um, but again, so you're isolated, and so the ridicule, there's no, you know, the ridicule is just coming at you. So it, much more difficult to be an activist in this field, which is why as late as 1996, no one had ever registered as a lobbyist on it. Right. Even though they had mm -hmm. hearings back in 68 uh, and 66. Because the ridicule, because it's, it's silly and ridicule, no one's going to pay you to do it. So there's no pay, nothing but ridicule, other than being first. And I, But my life was such that, yeah, I could be first. I had nothing to lose. I, I, had, I had been so unsuccessful in my previous life, so profoundly unsuccessful, without completely losing it. In other words, in other words, it, you can be unsuccessful to the point your life completely decays into nothing and you're, you know, you're like people all over Washington DC and, and LA, you're sleeping on the sidewalk, right? Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. Just, it's just nothing happening, right? You're living, you're paying the rent, you exist, but nothing is happening. So unsuccessful in that way, then it was time for me to do this. I had absolutely no barriers at all. Yeah, it's time for you to break and free. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, I, there was nothing anybody could do anything to, to me. There was nobody I had obligations to. Uh, I was completely free to do whatever the hell I wanted. Uh, and, uh, and I had to pay, deal with the consequences. But And so uh, being the first unpaid lobbyist on, on the subject of extraterrestrials. That's been and a rough ride, effort. I would imagine. But we do. So that 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 was that that was the the one good thing that came out of my failure to get it together is that it allowed me to go where somebody who had it together couldn't go. Not that there aren't some very together people that have gone into this field and doing a lot of stuff. Don't get me wrong. Right. But let's face it, when it comes to being a a, a registered activist lobbyist on this. Apparently nobody wanted to do that. Plenty of people have done research, done docs, written books, but nobody wanted to do that. Uh, and uh, so I, I said, okay, fine. It'll be me. Very lucky. Very lucky. So I am, I'm not going to have many regrets. I mean, I'll have some, but they're, they're just diminished by being part of this. Uh, to be part of and even a small way, and now there's people that are now, I know people that are heavily part of this, right? Sure, Obviously, yeah. Talking about, right? History books will write about them. History books are not going to write about me. But to be part of, in a meaningful way, the most profound event in human history, to be part of getting there and then experiencing the after effect of the event and maybe even being involved in the after events, the odds... And plus living long enough to do it, right? Because, I mean, I, one thing I, I did is I took relatively pretty good care of myself during my non-productive years. Sure. Uh, and so consequently, I bought some time. So I've already outlived my parents by seven years. So there's a chance I'm going to spend a number of years in the post-disclosure world. I mean, You'll be here. You'll be here. And personally, I, I again, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you, Mr. Bassett, again. You, in my opinion, will be remembered throughout history with this matter. And it won't be just a footnote in time. Uh, you will be definitely remembered as a trailblazer of sorts in this field. History decides who they remember and who they don't. But I will say this. Uh, it's, like, it's, like, it's like film. For better or for worse. Uh, if you're a film actor, you don't just leave a headstone behind. If somebody has to look up somewhere and go find you leave all this film, which is now being preserved. And so a thousand years from now, people will pull up a you know, little file and look at some movie that Cary Grant was in. And Archibald, please, will be remembered. I think it's McLean, whatever his last name is, uh, his real name. He will be remembered for, for, for a long, long time. They leave these incredible legacies. The downside is, is that as you get older, there's all this imagery and video of you as a younger a person. A young person, right. And you, you, and it's hard to get away from it. Uh, so you have to, that's an issue, but uh, you have a legacy. The internet now, I mean, the Wayback Machine, look at the Wayback Machine. Right, we're, we're immortalized now. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're really big at archive and stuff, and, 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 I'll, and we keep coming up with, I have, a, I have a flash drive that's this big. It's, it's smaller 
It's about the size of that little tip of my finger there. You see that? Right. Yeah, I see that. Two terabytes. And more powerful than what NASA sent to the moon. I I don't know. Power, but it's got two terabytes. And so the one thing we can do is store stuff. Not, not, Not physically. You know, the storage units, I mean, we do store stuff, but unfortunately... This, the, the real storage business doesn't work like the uh, uh, data storage business. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the amount of space it takes to, the amount of space you need for, uh, you know, apartments where the stuff hasn't changed in, in long time and may never change. That's right. But not in the data. And so we love to archive. So this, this, this whole world, this whole thing we're going through is going to be massively archived. And everybody's going to have a little piece of that legacy. Uh, so if you're into cremation, no big deal, no problem. You know, in a hole in the ground, and a and a stone of something that'll easily you know, erode or be treated badly. You just want to leave a mark in the in the uh, the web, a mark in the internet world, and and I've been able to do that. Uh, yeah. I'm glad for that. It's think about cool. all think about all the people that don't have anything, Mr. Bassett. They they. Um, you know, we, I have a show, I, you know, you have what's going on with you. We, we have things to look forward to. We have interest. We have all these things. We have an outlet. There's a lot of people out there that don't have jack shit. Oh yeah. And it's crazy. It's, well, it's, it's, it, it's, it, yeah, it's crazy. It's also and that's, trash. and that's what happens. People get caught up in all this other stuff and that's when crime and violence and everything happens when you don't have these kind of outlets, these creative sort of outlets or any other sort of outlet that you could put your energy into. If you don't have these things, you you become an animal almost. Well, I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you. Uh, it's kind of extreme we, what I said, but I mean, the it, best thing a person yeah. can have in life, and 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 our schools should be devoting enormous amounts of effort into this, right? But they don't. Uh, there's a lot of things they don't do. It's it's sad, really. The, the, the school system cannot service the modern world, and and, and the students are going to pay the price. Yeah. The most valuable thing one could learn early in life, either from their parents or from schools, is is a purpose. In other words, to, to understand the concept of purpose and actually find one that that motivates you, galvanizes you, and be able to be involved in that. Uh, not not phony, not made up, but something really serious, something mm-hmm. that connects to you, something meaningful. And it's very it's difficult. Uh, the percentage of people that find that is very small, uh, but yet it could be larger. But after that comes the fundamentals. Food, clothing, water, shelter. Those four things. And we screwed it up. We, oh, yeah. We, we, we we've gone far we away. Really, yeah, we've gone far from what's uh, natural. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't think it through. And so starting, you know, it's always been a problem. Yeah. Uh, but in the ancient days... There were not many people. There was a whole lot of land, and frankly, you could just build a little hut uh, and probably be comfortable. I, I think it was probably better off. I think there were probably a lot less homeless in the, in the 1100s than there are now. Right. Uh, but we, we just we didn't we didn't plan. We didn't think it through. And so, at the turn of the 20th century, right around 1900, when the real technological trend, the real technological age was was about to get underway. And just take off like a rocket, boom! Right, creating technologies and ideas that could would be able to make it possible for everybody on the planet to have those basics: food, clothing, shelter, and uh, and water. Uh, and then, with that, be able to explore other things add to their lives, we blew it. We absolutely blew it. What did we do starting in 1900 going forward? One, we just didn't address the population issue. That the fundamental idea was have as many kids as you want, as often as you want, the more the merrier, plenty of room, no big deal. And then secondly, instead of devoting resources to take advantage of the technology to advance people's lives. A huge proportion of all of that was used to make weapons for war and conduct war. 
So all that money, which which probably now starting at 1900 forward would probably translate in modern dollars into what 200 trillion, 300 trillion, whatever. Basically, yes. That didn't go for food, clothing, lodging, and shelter. It went for weapons of war, conducting war, preparing for war, and then blowing stuff up, and then having to pay to rebuild it, and then blowing it up again. We did that at the same time. We kept and 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 we killed hundreds of millions of people with all of this, but it wasn't enough because the population doubled and doubled again and doubled again and doubled again. It went from about 1.2 billion people to now 8 billion people. And because of all that hundreds of trillions we spent on making war, and blowing things up, we don't even come close to having enough resources for these people. And so now it's not just what do you have a purpose? Do you have a house? Do you have food, water, and clothing? And boy, I don't, I need to look on this number again, but I think the number that do not have all of that is got to be up in the 2 billion range. Got to be pretty high. It's high. And as a result, you have a lot of unhappy people. You have more suffering, unhappy, angry, frustrated people on the planet now than you had people at the turn of the 19th century, the 20th century. And, and if and if we had put a little thought to it and said, wait a minute, we got a golden opportunity here. But we just, you know, humans are animals. We 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 take one step forward. We deal with things as they come. We do a little planning. Eventually, we had tech to help us plan. But we just take things as they come, play it by ear, play it by ear, and see what happens. Well, what happens? There's eight billion people, twenty thousand nuclear weapons. Bio war labs, right? Degrading environment rapidly. Right? Unbelievable dissatisfaction, terrorism, and so forth. That's what we ended up with, starting from 1900 to now, 123 years. And along the way, extraterrestrials manifested themselves, which opened up all kinds of interesting possibilities. And we blew that too, right? Instead of embracing that and see it where it would take us, hit it, lied about it, demeaned the people that tried to find out. And that decision was made halfway through the 20th century. We'll never know what the 20th century, the rest of the 20th century would have been like if Truman had just come out and said, look, yeah, we got ETs here. We got the bodies, we got the craft. I don't know where this is going, but we're looking into it. So, no. another, by the way, so you, you believe the, the whole sit-down between um, aliens and President Dwight Eisenhower? Not proven. Not proven. It's just a rumors. Not proven. But not proven. I, I'm, there's, yeah. pieces of, there's pieces of this and pieces of that that we don't have the proof. Uh, and so if the evidence, print it this way. If, 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 I, if you take all the evidence and kind of look at it and make, and you have to have to make a call one way or the other, a legitimate call, not just whatever the hell you want. And, 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 and the call has to be the ET call. I think it's possible he was taken somewhere to see a body or maybe even see a live extraterrestrial. Uh, we had one at that point, I believe. Uh, and that's not the same thing as getting together with a bunch of extraterrestrials in a boardroom and cutting out deals to carve up the galaxy. No. Right. But it makes for a much better story. So that's more likely. I mean, to me, that's where I would go. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Uh, and it could have happened. And if it did, it's going to come out post-disclosure pretty quick. Yeah, I think it's possible. I don't rule and it out completely. List, on the list of PR problems that the government has post-disclosure, that's right up near the top. I mean, that's the one where you need to hire the top PR firm and do a balls out program to somehow mitigate the blowback and not get canceled. Because if the answer to the question, which will come up soon, because you know, the journalists have been on fire about this issue for quite some time. And so there are plenty of journalists out there, not just the ones we know about, like a Ross Coulthard or, or, or uh, Mesrich. There are so many that have looked at this issue. Uh, they've read stuff, they know stuff. And so they're going to be in that room, and the question is going to come up. Did the United States 
go into an arrangement with extraterrestrials, a formal arrangement in which we backed off in, in, in interfering with any abductions in return for technology. And if the answer is yes, and that is in fact the essence of the Grenada Treaty, then there's going to be an uproar. That's a big one-two combination right there. That's going to be an uproar. That is not going to be something where you can just say, look, it was national security. What can we do now? That's going to be a stinker. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I, in other words, there's, there is a limit to how much public relations they can do, how much damage control they can do. I mean, they're, they're doing a lot. They're doing a lot of the right things. But if the answer to that question is yes, they better be prepared to be very humble, very forthcoming, and respectful, because all hell's going to break loose on that one. So we'll see. Yeah, we're going to see. And uh, Mr. Bassett, I do want to thank you tremendously for this opportunity to, to speak to you as always. And it's always a truly honor and pleasure to have you here on the program. And before I let you go, mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you would like to add that you might have maybe forgotten? Uh, okay. or, or maybe if you, if you have any final words about anything, you're more than free to do so. But of course, I, I want you to promote anything you have coming up as well. Certainly. No, promo time. Yeah, let it rip. Promo time. Look, um, first of all, the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance, uh, my partner Dan Harare and I founded in uh, November 1. It's coming along, HollywoodDisclosureAlliance.org. Uh, it is a networking entity to bring people in the UAP ET world with professionals in the content creation world uh, so that they can identify each other and know who to get in touch with so they can start making contact with the post-disclosure world and make money. The HDA makes no money. It is absolutely non nonprofit, non-commercial. So we're just networking. And so if you go to that site, you will see a, a big group of what we call uh, film or entertainment industry founding members and then UAP ET founding members. Nice. Okay. Uh, and they're identified by their bio and, and, and uh, photo. Uh, the, and we're, gonna, we're growing that. We, we hope to see a very large number. We also have a sizable board of 20 and an executive committee. Uh, soon we'll be nonprofit and start raising money. So it's a, it's it's basically to to get so people can know mm -hmm. who to talk to, and break down the barriers that were created by the truth embargo all these years between the the mighty film industry making billions and billions of dollars on fictional ET movies, but now trying to get into the understanding that the, the biggest story in in, uh, in history is breaking and and they're they're starting to get into it, but they're not they have, they're not embracing the people that wrote all these books, so that has been created. We need what we need right now. Mostly. The most thing we need right now is we need more film industry professionals to join up as founding members. That costs nothing. In other words, if they've got some time and grade in the entertainment industry, directors, producers, writers, actors, you know, grip guys, whatever, if they're in the film industry and they, they, they want to be contacted, they would like to be involved in projects. Uh, and are willing to put their name and bio up on the site. We want them. We need film industry people because I've got scores of people in a holding pattern over Los Angeles circling, waiting to land, and I can't land them because right now we've got almost twice as many UAP as we do entertainment industry people in the, in the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. So as we add a couple of the entertainment industry, you can bring one of the ET people, and so we can get up to something that's reasonably balanced. I'd love to see it get up to around 70 uh, film industry uh, members, founding members, and maybe 100 UAP ET founding members. That would be pretty good, very nice. So that's the HollywoodDisclosureAlliance.org. And then I just started the uh, Shift Storm, which I talked about. Uh, shift, don't forget the F, Storm.org. Uh, go there, read it, and start tagging messages to the three senators who are the ones that will decide when the the hearing are and the, the hearings are going to start in the Senate, and ask them to do it in January nicely. They're, they're, they're the, they support us; they're on our side, but they're dealing with the political realities. We need those hearings in January. Or you can send an email; it's all up there at shiftstorm.com. And then I'm going to be speaking at the uh, Conscious Life Expo. I think it's mid-February, February 19th or something. Check it out, Conscious Life Expo. I have the link on the front of my site. Uh, it's probably going to be 25,000 people there at the, uh, it's pretty busy. They let the LAX Hilton 200 mm -hmm. speakers. Uh, the flu season will be over, but I'll be masked up anyway. And, uh, it's cool. It's one, it's one in, in terms of the, the, the combo conferences where you know, new age and other stuff and alternative plus UAP, probably one of the, it's the biggest in the world. Um, 
And then May 30 to June 3, I will be presenting at the Contact in the Desert, which may be the largest pretty much UAP conference, basically. It's almost all about that. It, 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 it's held. We, we're going to double the attendance of last year. It's going to be huge. Is that going to be at the Renaissance again? At the Renaissance Hotel in Indian Wells, just south of um, Palm Springs. Yeah, I saw you uh, there last time. And look, you know, you, you, get, you buy your tickets when you buy your tickets. But if you want to be in the hotel, you had better book it now. I'm serious. Or if you, if you, if you don't want to be in the Indian Wells, you want to be in another hotel for whatever reason, book it now because the, the hotel rooms are going to fill up. That's true. It's, 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 there's going to be thousands of people at this conference. Yeah, I tried to get a so, room last year and I couldn't. You got to get the rooms early. Get the room. You can buy the tickets anytime. But you've got to book those rooms. If, you know, and, 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 and you want you want to be at the Indian Wells if you can at the Renaissance because hey, it's a fantastic resort. Oh, it's a beautiful, right? you know. And hang out. So I'm just saying, do that. Uh, all that's up on my website. Uh, and well, let's see, there's something else. Oh, there's something else. Oh, yeah, your final message to us here. Um, well, let me also mention that Paradigm Research Group will be converting to a 501c3 pretty soon and starting to raise tax-free, tax-deductible money. Uh, I'm going into that zone and going there because of the post-exposure world. Uh, in other words, PRG is going to be less activist and more think tank. In other words, I want to create a mod modest think tank right here next to the White House, practically. Uh, get a group of people together to to provide information, white papers, whatever, to influence or in involve people on this issue. Um, oh, I just made a mistake. Hang on a second. No worries. I kind of goofed. That's okay. It happens. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to do that. And uh, we'll be looking to raise money for Paradigm Research Group. Boutique Think Tank, two blocks in the White House. But Daniel Sheehan, mm -hmm. who who runs the Romero Institute out of California, has been for thirty some years. He has he finally got funding for his new Paradigm Institute, which is a big think tank. Uh, it's off. It has an office one block from the Capitol building. It's also going to have an office in Los Angeles. So the new Paradigm Institute, newparadigminstitute.org, they're they're going to be raising millions of dollars, and they're going to have a very high end advisory board nice and and it's being created for the post disclosure world well, and, and and again let me repeat this for those of you that 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 are figured this out it's time to get ready for the post disclosure world right i mean if you want to be playing if you want to be uh, in pl playing ball you, you got to get your suit on you got to get your cleats on you got to get down to the stadium um because it's about to start and boy, when it starts, that guns go off. It's going to be balls out. I mean, it's going to be crazy. And I mean, you can just be a spectator. I mean, if you want, you can just you know, you just back, watch it, enjoy it. That's fine. Watch it on your big screen TV. But if you want to be involved, you need to start getting ready now. Um, there's a thousand ways to participate, a thousand ways to engage. Uh, whether you're just in basic business, I mean, businesses are going to change change uh there's going to be business opportunities like crazy in the post disclosure world that didn't exist now whatever it's coming just giving you a tip you know, whatever so uh that's kind of it i think I'll, that'll do for now thank very you so nice. much mm -hmm. very nice thank you very much for being a part of the program we will talk to you again on the other side my friend ad astra